Welcome physics people. Today's video will be looking at Lenz's law. In particular, we'll be focusing on the graphing of EMF from magnetic flux. So a quick recap, Lenz's law. When a conductor experiences a change of magnetic flux, a current will be induced such that its magnetic field acts to oppose the initial change in magnetic flux. Very important law that has great applications. And Faraday's law. Faraday's law states that a changing magnetic flux in a conducting loop or coil induces an electromotive force equivalent to a voltage with a magnitude that is proportional to the rate of change of the magnetic flux. As an equation, we know that the EMF is equal to the negative n phi dt. Also, the EMF is proportional to the negative change in flux over time, which can be expressed in words as the negative rate of change of flux with respect to t, or in simple terms, it represents the negative gradient of a phi versus t graph. And that's the application we'll be looking at in today's video. I would recommend people look at my previous video on magnetic flux just to bring themselves up to speed. Consider a square coil rotating 360 degrees through a vertical magnetic field. For today's video, we want to look at what would the variation of the induced EMF look like. So we have in front of us the graph of the change in magnetic flux with angle. And from that, we're going to try and derive the change in EMF versus angle. So a reminder, the EMF is proportional to the negative rate of change in the magnetic flux. Let's try and apply that rule. First of all, let's locate the turning points of the magnetic flux versus angle graph, as these represent gradients of zero. So here's our first extended gradient of zero, a turning point, our second one at 180 degrees, and our third one at 360. So here we have our turning points at zero degrees, 180 degrees, and 360 degrees, where the gradient is zero. Now recall, when the gradient is zero, the EMF induced will be zero. So at zero degrees, we have an induced EMF of zero. At 180 degrees rotation of our coil, we have an induced EMF of zero. And at 360, we also have an induced EMF of zero. So we've got one, two, three points on our sketch already. Continuing on, step number two, locate the steepest gradients. So here we have our variation of our flux versus angle graph. Whereabouts are the steepest gradients? So first of all, there's our first steepest gradient, a negative gradient at the 90 degree mark. And also our steepest positive gradient at the 270 degree mark. If we were to look at the graph, we see that we start at a zero gradient and that increases, increases, increases. And the steepest point in a negative gradient is at the 90 degree mark. It then flattens out to zero, increases, increases, to a maximum at 270 degrees, and then flattens back out to zero at a full 360 rotation. Now recall, the EMF induced is proportional to the negative rate of change of the flux, or the negative gradient. So here at the 90 degree rotation point, we have a negative maximum gradient. Now applying that to this rule tells me that a negative maximum gradient will generate a positive maximum EMF. We realize the EMF induced in this coil is proportional to the gradient, but it's the negative of the gradient. So a negative maximum gradient of the change in flux will result in a positive maximum EMF. Likewise, a positive maximum gradient at an angle of 270 degrees will result in a negative maximum EMF because the EMF is proportional to the negative of the gradient or the negative of the rate of change of flux. Now, final step is just join the dots. So as we draw that up, you see that we've effectively changed from a cosine function to a sine function. So that's what the variation of induced EMF looks like, induced in the coil as it's rotated through 360 degrees of a vertical magnetic flux. Our second scenario, this is also in a previous video, consider a square moving at a constant velocity to the right through a vertical magnetic field. What would the variation of magnetic flux look like? I'm now extending that to ask, what would the variation of the induced EMF look like? Exactly the same skills as our previous example, only this time it's probably easier to apply. Recall the EMF is proportional to the negative rate of change of the flux, or in simple terms, it's equal to the negative gradient of the flux time graph. So at step one again, let's locate the gradients that are equal to zero. It's the first starting point. So here's our first gradient of zero, our second gradient of zero, and our third gradient of zero. You'd recall from our previous example, the gradients of zero induce EMFs of zero. For this first section, where we have a gradient of zero, that represents an EMF of zero. 
Likewise, in our second section, a gradient of zero represents an EMF of zero. And finally, in our third section, gradient of zero represents an EMF of zero. Let's now consider those regions that have a non-zero gradient. So the first one here is a constant positive gradient. Second one is a constant negative gradient. The EMF is proportional to the negative rate of change of the flux, or in this case, the negative gradient. So here we have, in this section, colored blue, a positive constant gradient. So that means I'm going to induce a constant EMF. However, a positive constant gradient will induce a negative constant EMF because this negative rate of change. Okay, this gradient is constant positive, but when I multiply it by the negative, I end up with a negative constant EMF. Likewise, in our second section, a negative constant gradient of the flux over time graph, that generates a positive constant EMF. Again, I take a negative constant gradient and I multiply it by a negative and I get a positive constant EMF. And step three, simply joining the lines, we fill in our gaps. Okay, so here we have it. What would the variation in the induced EMF look like? It is as follows. Now, your turn. Figure one below shows a graph of magnetic flux versus time. So here's our top graph, figure one. Sketch the induced EMF on the set of axes provided in figure two. I recommend you try this, pause the video and come back to check your answers. Let's follow the same steps. So remember, the EMF is proportional to the negative rate of change of flux, which is the same as the negative gradient. Step one, let's locate the gradients that are zero. Here's our gradients of zero on the original flux versus time graph, and they represent EMFs of zero. Step one complete. Step two, let's locate the non-zero gradients. So here's our non-zero gradients highlighted in red. So we have a constant positive gradient that will induce a constant negative EMF because the EMF is proportional to the negative of the gradient. Also, you notice the change in flux in the remaining sections that I have read are occurring in the time frame only half that of this initial change in flux. This results in an increased rate of change of flux. This is going from a zero value to a maximum in a unit of time or a duration of time. This is dropping from maximum to zero in only half the time. So the magnitude of the EMF induced in these shorter periods of time will be double that of the EMF induced in this longer duration of time. So we have a constant positive gradient induces a constant negative EMF. We have a constant negative gradient induces a constant positive EMF. And because that gradient is double the size of the first, it has double the amplitude as well. Our second negative gradient here, a constant negative gradient induces a constant positive EMF. It's the same rise over run as this particular section. So it's exactly the same in magnitude. And finally, our increase in EMF is exactly the same magnitude opposite direction to the previous two. So it also has the same amplitude. However, because it's a positive gradient, we take the negative of that gradient to calculate our induced EMF. This has a negative amplitude. Finally, let's join our lines to complete this graph. And there you have it, we've sketched the induced EMF on a set of axes. Our final example, a single copper coil A is connected to a power supply. There we have copper coil A. A second copper coil B is placed directly on top of the first. Figure one below shows a graph of current in coil A versus time. And the task is to sketch the induced current in the second coil, IB, on the set of axes provided in figure two. So at this point, I'll ask you to pause the video Try this yourself and check your answers against mine shortly. Note that in coil A, the flux in A is proportional to the current. So when I have no current in A, I have no magnetic flux. When I increase the current in A, I'm increasing the magnetic flux. When I've got a maximum constant current in A, I've got a maximum constant magnetic flux and so forth. So this graph really is representing a magnetic flux graph. The values would be different, but the proportionalities will be exactly the same. Keeping that in mind, let's locate gradients of zero. So here we have gradients of zero in our first above graph. Now, we said before the EMF was proportional to the negative rate of change of the flux. Well, the current is also proportional to the negative rate of change of flux. So where we have zero change in current in the initial coil A, which also represents zero change in magnetic flux, we get zero current induced in coil B. Let's look at the non-zero regions. Here we have a constant increase in magnetic flux of coil A, which will induce a constant negative current 
In our second section of non-zero gradient, we have a constant negative gradient, which in turn generates a constant positive current. In our third section, we have a constant negative gradient of change of flux over time, which induces a constant positive current. And finally, our last section, we have a constant positive gradient of flux over time, which induces a constant negative current in our coil B. Let's now look at the size or the amplitude of our induced currents. In our second two sections, we have the same change in magnetic flux as we do in the first two. However, this occurs over half the time. So our gradient is twice that of sections one and two. Accordingly, our amplitude is double because the current being induced is equal to the negative rate of change of flux. We have twice the rate at which the flux changes, so we get double the amplitude. Let's join the lines. And there we have it. This is what our induced current in the second coil, current B, would look like as a result of the changing magnetic flux or the changing current in the first coil, coil A. Thank you so much for watching this Juddy Productions video. If you've enjoyed this video or indeed learned something, please don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.